Okay, so we're going to pick up here with part three. And in part two, we talked uh, a lot about motor areas. We talked about Broca's area. We talked about the uh, primary motor cortex and the premotor area. Um, and these are all having to do with motor signals uh, originating in the brain, originating somewhere, and traveling out via efferent neurons away from the central nervous system and out to some effector um, tissue, some effector cell or some muscle like that. So we thought about, you know, if you're stimulating skeletal muscle to reach down and pick up a pencil to then write, that's originating in the, pre, uh, in the primary motor uh, cortex of the precentral gyrus. We also talked about the motor homunculus, this kind of um, distribution of uh, different body parts and how different body parts and different body regions uh, receive more or less um, attention, if you will, more or less focus in terms of neurons uh, than other regions. So now that we're in the sensory uh, areas, we'll talk about a very similar thing, but instead of motor things originating from um, a region within the brain and going out, we're talking about sensory stimuli originating from the periphery so at some sensory receptor and now coming into the nervous system. So we have our primary somatosensory cortex, and this is going to be located in the post-central gyrus. So that gyrus that's just behind our central sulcus, that's where we're going to find our primary somatosensory cortex. This is going to be receiving um, sensory information uh, that was detected by sensory receptors in the body and, and bring it into the central nervous system, into the brain. And again, it's mapped to a specific area just like our primary motor cortex was. So the primary somatosensory cortex has a sensory homunculus, this kind of distribution of body parts and regions. And you'll see, just like the, the motor homunculus, different body parts and regions are bigger uh, than other parts, meaning that there is a greater concentration of sensory receptors there um, within that particular area. And we now have somatosensory association areas or asso association cortex. So a primary, whenever we talk about, we'll see it with auditory, we'll see it with visual. The primary region, the primary cortex, this is where we're receiving an initial stimulus. And association area or association cortex, this is where we begin to um, associate it and interpret it and we can also relate it to uh, other things, so maybe past memories. And so our somatos uh, somatosensory association area is going to be just behind the uh, primary somatosensory cortex, which is part of that postcentral gyrus. And that's where we're going to integrate. We're going to analyze things that we have received, the sensory stimuli. And we may also begin to relate it to some past um, experience or past memory. So if you feel coins in your pocket, this is the kind of example you have here, uh, without even looking in your pocket, looking at the coins, you likely know what coin you're feeling just by its texture, by its size, and by you actually feeling it, okay? So this interpretation of sensory stimuli is occurring within the somatose somatosensory association cortex. Likewise, if you uh, feel something and then you begin to associate it with a past memory or some past experience, that again is happening in the somatosensory association area. And again, like I said, we'll see the same thing with our vision. We'll see the same thing with our um, with our sense of hearing as well, with, with auditory uh, cortexes. So here's our primary somatosensory cortex again in this postcentral gyrus, just beneath, uh, I'm sorry, just posterior to our central sulcus. And then right back in here is where we would have our uh, uh, somatosensory association cortex just behind this primary cortex here. So this is a, a graphical representation of the, of the sensory homunculus. And you see it looks a lot like our motor homunculus in that you have a distribution of body regions and parts uh, along, different, uh, along different areas uh, of the uh, primary somatosensory cortex. So as I was saying, we have our, um, uh, the, the sensory homunculus, and like I was saying, it, it's, it, it's distributed across this postcentral gyrus um, in, in, a, in a similar pattern to what you saw with the motor homunculus and the primary motor cortex uh, with different areas and different regions of the body uh, being greater or uh, being larger or smaller uh, relative to the number of sensory receptors in that area. And so you can see face again, hands, very large areas like arms, shoulder, uh, 
legs, uh, toes, things like that, um, for the most part, are pretty small. So we have some more uh, sensory areas. So this is going to be our primary visual cortex. And I think a lot of people um, already have the, uh, at least in a, in a very basic way, the knowledge that the, uh, the occipital lobe has something to do with vision. Um, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, the, the occipital lobe contains the primary visual cortex. This is where we're going to receive um, sensory uh, stimuli uh, with vision. So whether it is uh, a shape, some type of shadow, some type of color, or something like that, where we pick it up, light is uh, focused on our retina, and, and then it travels along uh, cranial nerve 2, which is the optic nerve. Um, and we'll look at the specific layout of the optic nerve when we talk about the peripheral nervous system and, and, the, and the cranial nerves. Uh, but what it does is at the very back you have the optic tracks um, that uh, relay uh, sensory and visual stimuli uh, to the occipital lobe where it is then um, received. Um, you probably also know that the, in, in a similar way to that, so the brain shows, uh, the brain shows something called lateralization and that certain sides of the brain have to do with certain functions and certain um, uh, things, and then the other side of the brain has to do with other things. You probably also know that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, uh, and our sense of vision is very similar. So nerve fibers from the right so side of our brain, some of them go, uh, and some of them are uh, going to, uh, if you're talking about the eye, I'm sorry, I'll start over. If you're going from one eye, some fibers stay on the same side of the brain, and some cross over, and then you go to the other eye, some stay on that same side of the brain, some cross over. And so what you end up getting is um, our brain is interpreting, one side of the brain is interpreting visual stimuli uh, from both eyes. Okay, And so, like I said, when we look at the pathway of the uh, of cranial nerve to the optic nerve, you'll see that some fibers will cross over at something known as the optic chiasm, the Greek letter, uh, or Greek word chi, the letter chi means a, the, the, like an X. And so what you see is that this chiasm you have fibers crossing over uh, from the left eye over to the right side of the brain, but some stay on the left, and then from the right eye, some stay on the right side of the brain, but they also cross over to the left there. And then we also have the visual association area. So again, the association area is where we're going to be integrating, analyzing, and relating um, different types of stimuli. So in this in this case, we're relating visual stimuli. So maybe you, you see something, you see a person, you see a, a sign, you see something, and it sparks a, a memory, uh, and you're able to think back to maybe a different time. You're you're able to relate it to a different thing. So oftentimes you may be driving, you pass a a road a roadside landmark, you pass something in town or something uh, near your house, and when you see that structure or that sign or that thing, you're able to relate it to something else, and you think back to a memory or some uh, some uh, instance in which something happened. Maybe you were in a, a car accident or something at a particular intersection or a particular um, highway or something. And every time you drive past that highway or you're on that highway, when you see it, it triggers a memory and you think about that. That's all occurring uh, in your visual uh, association cortex. Now, uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of go back a little bit um, talking about kind of how, how some of these areas were discovered, particularly talking about the uh, this primary visual cortex and the occipital lobe dealing with our sense of vision. Um, back in the, uh, I believe it was kind of the uh, early 1900s, maybe early to mid 1900s, um, during different wars, there were soldiers who were being uh, shot and being injured, uh, and some were being shot from above, and the their the bullets were striking them in the back of the head uh, near the near the occipital lobe, and a lot of these men survived. Um, but they all tended to see uh, a, uh, or tended to present with the same deficit, and this deficit was in their sense of vision. And so it was kind of hypothesized and, and understood back then, at least in some way, that the back of the brain, this, this occipital lobe in the posterior part of our brain, had something to do uh, with, with vision. And so this is a way uh, a lot of different discoveries um, in neuroscience, but really in in, in science in general, a lot of things have been discovered by, by accident. Something happened that isn't necessarily, uh, wasn't thought to be a good thing or it wasn't really planned, but because of that, 
you end up getting some some groundbreaking discovery that that pay, that paves the way for future uh, future research and future uh, discoveries. So, uh, the last uh, or one of the last sensory areas we'll talk about. I think we have one more after this is our auditory area. So uh, we have a primary auditory cortex and an auditory association. So our temporal lobe underlying our temporal bone is going to be um, involved with our uh, our sense of of hearing, so detecting auditory stimuli. Um, in this temporal lobe at this auditory, uh, primary auditory cortex, this is where we receive uh, information and, and we perceive it. And then our auditory association area just beneath the primary auditory cortex, this is where we begin to associate it. We relate it to past things. So again, maybe you hear, uh, you hear a noise and you're able to relate it to a past occurrence. You hear a familiar voice that you hear a voice of somebody who maybe you haven't seen in a while uh, but by hearing that voice hearing those words you're able to think back and relate it to hey that is so and so my friend from you know college or from high school and you're able to recognize their voice you may also be able to recognize we can differentiate between human voices um, and and non-human noises from animals or things that are not human um, as well as sounds that were made by animals and things that were made not by animals. So speaking, um, whether you're talking about an animal maybe barking or growling, compared to uh, something else, maybe you know the scraping of something on the ground or dropping something on the floor, we can uh, differentiate between these sounds and relate it to past experiences. And this is all occurring in this auditory association area. So. Um, our association areas. We'll talk a little bit about uh, about this. So these are going to be different than motor and different than sensory and si different than sensory, but we're going to be able to analyze and, and develop different types of responses uh, by using these uh, these uh, association areas. So one uh, main one is our prefrontal cortex. So this area in the um, frontal lobe where you have things like reasoning. You're able to plan things. Um, you can think of different things. So your thoughts, your your intelligence, your intellect, all of this um, is going on uh, and is kind of controlled by your prefrontal cortex. So this is also um, a very important brain region for things like your personality, memory. Um, we know that in uh, in times if you uh, if you drink too much alcohol, you can inhibit and kind of paralyze your prefrontal cortex. And so if this area is dealing with things like your reasoning, your planning, your ability to make sound judgments, then if you paralyze or inhibit this area, like what happens if excessive alcohol consumption takes place, then you see the deficits in those things. You know that people who um, have consumed a lot of alcohol may not have the best um, intellectual decision making. They can't reason very well. Maybe their thoughts are a little strange. Uh, their ability to plan may not be as uh, as sound as it is um, during normal times. And so uh, you also see maybe changes with their personality where somebody is, uh, they, act a, uh, they act a particular way um, without alcohol. When, when they do consume alcohol, maybe they act slightly different. Um, and so this, this has to do with your prefrontal cortex. And if you alter that in some way, um, then you can alter um, the way that you would act and how and how people would perceive you. So we have Wernicke's area as well as an association area. Now this is going to be kind of you can somewhat relate it to the to the Broca's area that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is going to be involved with language. So whereas Broca's area was a motor area, remember it was a it was a motor area dealing with speech production. So we're initiating spoken language. Wernicke's area is going to be involved with um, uh, with comprehending language uh, as well as um, verbalizing unfamiliar uh, written words. And so damage to this area, which is, uh, we'll take a look at where it's located. It's located more posterior than Broca's area, uh, closer to the kind of uh, parietal occipital lobe uh, kind of junction. Um, this is going to be involved with language. So if you're trying to um, interpret some type of language that is written, if you're trying to listen to somebody and as they're talking you're trying to understand and comprehend what it is they're saying, if you have damage to this uh, to this region of the brain, this Wernicke's area, you can have difficulties and deficits uh, in trying to comprehend and understand those different things. So you can see it here. Here's the Broca's areas before. Here's going to be our 
our Wernicke's area, kind of here, back kind of by the uh, parietal lobe, but a part of our, uh, our temporal lobe uh, right here where you can see circled in, uh, circled in orange. So we mentioned a second ago this idea of lateralization that different sides of the brain can control different things. Um, and we talked about Broca's areas located primarily in, uh, in, the, in the left cerebral hemisphere uh, in about 90% of the population. Um, different sides of your brain in general have different functions. So left side may be more uh, logical reasoning, math, language, whereas the right side may be more um, your ability to have um, uh, artistic abilities, your memory, intuition, if you're more a visual type of person, spatial skills. Now, it's somewhat of a, of a myth that somebody is, is purely left brain, purely right brain. Um, both sides are working. Some people may have a tendency to be more uh, drawn to uh, science and math and logic, and some may be more drawn to um, the arts uh, and things like that. Um, and, and again, like I said, 90% of people we use our left hemisphere for language. So when we're initiating uh, spoken language, when we're trying to talk, uh, that's the Broca's area, that motor area, and like we said, most uh, individuals uh, in the population have that located uh, in their left uh, cerebral hemisphere. So we will stop there and we'll pick up with these different types of fibers uh, in the next part, which I believe is part four.